Okay. Um, uh, it's very honor to be here in Shanghai, it's the Kubikon China. So um, this today, I'm going to share with you the uh, edge computing. Let me start the timer. Okay, the edge computing in the Kubernetes, um, some of our best practice and for the future. So this is actually the joint presentation between me and Inding. Inding is an engineer manager for Kubernetes in Google, and he's also the Alpha Edge AKNO TS chair, Kubi Edge co-founder and maintainer, the CNCF TOC, the talk contributor. Myself, I'm a director for uh, infrastructure ecosystem in Arm in uh, San Jose, and uh, I'm also the Alpha Edge board chair. So here, today's agenda, how we navigate today's session. First, I would like to give an introduction to the edge computing, and then I will talk about the need for Kubernetes in edge computing, and also we'll share some of the very uh, practical, the real world the best practice for implementing edge in the Kubernetes. Um, then uh, I would like to discuss with you of some of the future chains and considerations. Hell, here, let me introduce how we understand edge computing. You can see here um, the need for Kubernetes in edge computing, the best practice for implementation, the edge in the Kubernetes. So do you know what's the edge, where's the edge? Because a lot of people think the edge is just your phone or your home gateway. Here, the definition of edge is wherever the source of the data to the destination of the data, anywhere in between, we can call it edge. Think about that. That's why our edge can be located all the way to your phone, your home gateway, a server in your IT server room in the building in the enterprise, and also the um, Edge cloud server, or even in some regional data centers. Yeah, they are all, we can all call them edge, depends where they're located. And there are some of the future chains and consideration. If you are here to attend GoSend, you know uh, there are a lot of topic, AI track has a lot of people. Like in Elf Edge, I'm chairing, we have the Elf Edge AI um, project, the AI Edge project. We try to see like today, a lot of uh, la large language models, it trains very well in the center. But speaking of uh, inference on the edge, how do they adapt to the uh, resource restraint and the resource constraint environment with the uh, ultra low latency and also with um, uh, the bandwidth need and also with um, the how much memory you, you like you can provide that much of bandwidth, right? Um, and then uh, I can talk about some of QA, uh, Q&A session. There is definitely some benefits. So if we do edge computing, we can have the reduced latency, faster response uh, due to local press, uh, processing. You know the 20 millisecond for 5G end to end. Think about when you call, have a video chat, or have a FaceTime with your friends, like how soon can they pick up the phone? That's how it goes from Alice to Bob, all the way across the whole network from here to China, across the Pacific Ocean, and arrive in the States. And also, if we do a lot of a processing in the edge, we can do the bandwidth efficiency. Like, less data sent across the market and across the network. For example, a lot of like inference you can do as close as close to your form or like any of the edge container, edge virtual machines, and edge bare metal in any of the uh, edge cloud. Like you can use Volcano Engine, Ali Cloud, Baidu Cloud, Tencent Cloud, it's up to you. And, but the specific part for China market is like this cloud, the hyperscale cloud has to resign in one of the telco cloud first, like China Mobile, China Unicom, China Telecom. This is the different part. That's why I think in China, the provide the infrastructure as a service for edge computing is really important. However, in the States, because um, the edge cloud doesn't have to deploy three times in different uh, operators. 
But here in China, you do have to duplicate your edge cloud resources and deployment in China Telecom, China Mobile, and China Unicom. Yeah, so this is the thing. Another thing is the enhanced privacy and security. We also see some of the change. Some people, I just have a, at the lunch table with this cast, like some people wanting to have called iMac. You can even do, put all your AI, large language model, in the Apple box at your home. You can already build a large language model, or we call small large language model, at your house. You can keep all the privacy in your house or close, or very close to where you are, then you can like be free, like at my home in the States, I have four cameras at my house. Now it goes to the Comcast, I can see like when my dog's passing and whenever my kid's just walking there, anybody delivery man there. Um, but sometimes I worry about the privacy. Yeah, if my kids just run there, like didn't just well, like what, what the people in the IT room, they will see it. Like, so this is edge computing we need to solve the problem with privacy and security. So the data remains local, reduce the exposure risks. Like today, there's so many data is created every day. We don't know where it goes. That's why it's so important. So here, I wanted to highlight the need for Kubernetes in edge computing. Why Kubernetes is essential for edge. So if you go to the uh, repos in the Kubernetes or in CNCF, you can see a lot of uh, Kubi Edge, Open Yard, or K3S, Mini Kubernetes. There are so many distros. That means in different de uh, deployment scenarios and use cases, you will see the different ask. Like the scalability, how we handled thousands of edge devices. I don't know other, maybe there are some other technologies, but I think the Kubernetes and its distros will solve the problem and serve the purpose very well. And also for the seamless deployment and management, because for example, like the Kubicom I'm gonna talk about later, and it can do the cloud and edge synergize very well. And also talking about the resilience, the self-healing capability for robustness. Because we are based on the cloud native environment with the Kubernetes, uh, with the CNCF components. That's why, and the method is so similar and seamless, consistent. It's very easy to highlight whose problem. Not like when the problem happens, issues happens, to point your finger to the other hand. Right? It's not my fault, it's other people's fault. But with this, it's very easy to diagnose, diagnose where the problem is, then solve the problem segment by segment. Here, some of the best practice, like the key practice for Kubernetes Edge deployment, we have the modular design, break the applications into smaller independent modules to deploy at the edge. So if you see um, some of our new uh, AI edge projects, we do uh, break it down into the ice, like you can use Shifu, EdgeX Foundry, or you can even use Fletch as an infrastructure as a service. Then you have to provide the APIs to the upper layer, it's called the AI Elastic Framework. But within this, you have many models, how you do the control management and even uh, orchestration and scheduling. So this all needs a lot of uh, uh, small applications into the small modules. The other thing is the state management. It's very important because for the edge, for any applications, no matter is um, like a cloud gaming, cloud phones, you need to maintain the state. Otherwise, you don't know where am I, for example, I'm playing Wang Zhe Rongyao, right? So like how many people play, oh, I see people smiling. You heard me play a lot. Um, so if you are in the middle of something and playing, if our edge use cases or edge deployment like stop your service, like you're losing your game, this is not the best experience. So we have to design the stateless application or synchronized state to avoid this data um, inconsistency. This is very important for a lot of uh, games fans. And we do, uh, like Elf Edge, publish a cloud gaming white paper. 
I think the work was led by YSEMI, Jenny Motion. Jenny Motion, you, you guys play games, you know Jenny Motion? And Tencent, a lot of contribution from the uh, China community. Very good. Um, here, I would like to share another best practice, like how we refine the Kubernetes edge deployment. So the optimization, we wanted to ensure minimum and efficient data transfer. For example, a lot of times you have the data transfer, but you don't have the layered transfer, and you just transfer everything across the network. It's not worthy because some of the information is not critical. You can put the data in layered and put a different layer of data into object storage, right? You only transfer the key data. For example, there will be a sliding window for the car. Oops, sorry. They are just accidentally click something. Okay, sorry. Um, like we have a Kuiper in Elvedge. Uh, we just have the slicing window like 10 minutes. If any car accident happened, we only grab the uh, data uh, 10 minutes before the accident happens. This is called 10 minute sliding window. That's why, because there are so many sensors in the car, you can like collect and stop them everywhere. I know even some of the sensors, the memories in the car, you can store all the way to one gig, but like you can just store all the data for the whole day, right? Even you have the best and the biggest data center, you can't do that. You have to find a way to how to ensure the minimum and efficient transfer for the data. And security, this, I couldn't emphasize this more. We have some security experts sitting on the corner. Hello, <laughs> from SUSE. Yeah, we do use SUSE a lot here. Um, the secure device identity, I think they they talk about zero, zero trust this morning at their keynote. And also use the end-to-end -end encryptions. I think this is very important for edge computing because a lot of applications like retail and it runs on the, like a lot of our personal uh, images and some uh, user-related things and going through the edge computing and the networks. And we wanted to apply the regular patch management like over the air. For example, like a lighting as a service. Here, this is Luminaire, right? Oh, it's a shaking, is it earthquake something? <laughs> there were like a four to five sensors inside. Then you think about how we do the patch. We tear it down? No, we do over the air. So we want everything is over the air, not like you have to break the power system and do it again. So this is why what I mean for apply the regular patches management. Here we go. So um, e, the, the next best practice I want to share is uh, elevating the Kubernetes edge deployment. So resource management. I used to work in a product called resource manager for a couple of years, quite a long time for me. Yeah. Um, the resource management, management has to optimize for CPU, memory, and storage. Because like at the lunch table, I talk about acceleration. A lot of times you wanted to offload your workloads, no matter it's like from DVDK or from the DPI or from any like over the PCIe things, like you wanted them not running uh, on your main CPU, but you can offload to DPU and then how much memory you want, you wanted to understand. And also logging and monitoring. Um, I, I think everybody used the logging. I'm not sure about the monitoring. So implement centralized the logging and the real-time monitoring for the quick issue detection and resolution. We do have a use case. Um, some member company of LFH, they do the PCB board detection because they have all the logging. The logging use some AI algorithm they can find out, oh, what the problem may be. And this logging sounds like a really, uh, am I blocking you? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so you may be found like some of the log really abnormal. It shouldn't be like that. And then automatically it pop up and say, hey, there may be a PCB de de detection, PCB defection there. You have to figure it out and find a uh, um, good solution for that. Okay, let's come to a real, um, very concrete example here. 
Um, this is the LF Edge catalog. What does it mean? So you, many people, you have cars, right? When you go to a forest store, you want to buy a car, what do you want to do? You want to try? Do you want to try for like uh, 20 minutes, just drive around in the very busy Shanghai center? Or you want to say, oh, can I drive for two days? I get used to how the car runs. I know how it works. This is an idea. We have this Elf Edge catalog. You can have a robust uh, um, solution for managing, managing Elf Edge applications. So through this, you can really try how it works. Here on the left-hand side is the Edge Gateway node. It includes um, Smarter. Smarter is open source component. Smarter Edge agent uh, with uh, going through the CNI or DNS device manager on the top. But here, you can see a lot of uh, parse audio and machine learning applications like Mbeard and the front bit machine learning applications like video and supporting X264, 265, FFmpeg, AV1, all of this, and also the GStreamer. Uh, so, and then it goes through a smarter cloud services through the edge control plan and the edge data plan. So we use AWS EC2 instances, but here if you want to use Ali Cloud or the others, we use the K3S clusters and we have adventure people sitting here. <laughs> and through the front bit and influx DB and finally send your data through the Grafana. So the Grafana will do some of the um, monitoring and showcase how much power you're using, like what's the CPU usage and memory usage, et cetera. So in this case, um, our value of this catalog is to drive for the evolution of edge computing and it's very essential as IoT for smart cities, emerging technologies grow importance like uh, um, autonomous driving, et cetera. And also um, the target audience, we want to target for the developers, IT professors, and individuals in triggered by edge computing. So the Elf Edge catalog is basically a gateway to explore and experiment. Like you have two days you drive in the car and you know everything, well, not really everything, but you got a chance to touch every aspect of that. Um, this is another uh, example. It, I see some of the Kubernetes uh, maintainers are here and the uh, uh, Kubi Edge maintainers here. This is actually a real case. It happens in the highway ETC system. Who knows what ETC stands for? It stands for um, electronic toll collector system. So like uh, every day you drive through the high highway, you have to pay. And here you have the own premium toll uh, system on the top, and then uh, the Pro Provisico Highway Network ONM centers on the top. But here, when you go through this uh, toll gate, you can see, and we have the toll collection, we have the ETC gate, either on x86 IPC or the ARM CAN server, or um, then we put the video and the vehicle co collaborative edge here. And then you use the Kubernetes and Kubi Edge to connect the edge to the cloud. At the central cloud, you can have some vehicle infra cooperative and with the video cloud to see like what kind of, uh, like you can identify like what card, your place number, and is this car like a violate anything, but you collect the, uh, all the tolling information to the pro vehicle, pro -visual uh, highway network OEMN center. OEM center provisions for the OEM, but sometimes it also involved in the charging system. So here, the benefits for this, uh, we have more than 50K plus edge nodes. It's moderated by Kubi Edge. And there are 500K plus containers in total. 300 million data records per day. This is a lot a lot of data. If you don't put, uh, process in the, in the edge, see how much data is across the network, cause the congestion. And so time used the passing uh, through tour station include like uh, from 15 seconds to two seconds uh, in average per car. And, and then we, I know, so I don't know how many people are gonna drive for the 
Mid Autumn Festival and National Day. So if we use the the could be edge everywhere, it could be like 29 seconds to uh, shrink to three seconds. It's a lot. So you want to go home to reunite with your family. So this end end user is under confirmation to publish more. So but this is a real case. It happens in China for uh, many provinces. Um, so for the future change. Uh, we really see the AI in the edge, the local processing for quicker insight. Uh, it's mainly, I mean, uh, the inference. The inference could happen in the GPU or on the CPU, but it's definitely on the edge. I think this is the most efficient way. The other one is 5G and edge. The ultra-reliable, low-latency communi communications. We already see a lot of 5G, even 6G. Uh, they wanted to have edge computing for the ultra-low-latency uh, use cases. And also for the service meshes, managing the inter-service communication efficiency. It's because the service mesh in Kubernetes is so efficient for edge computing. We usually use them as a pair. Here, considering for the future, we'll see uh, how we navigate the future challenges in Kubernetes edge computing. Um, interoperability, we really like this because in our community, we do a lot of interrupt event and we do demo proof of concept and we sometimes do even the trial. Like uh, China Mobile, they work together with Migu to run their, uh, it's called a CFN, the um, Computing Force Network, and I think Jiangsu Information Harbor. And this is a really good use case. They put a lot of vendors, uh, edge computing devices, the servers together to ensure uh, the uh, compatibilities. I think backward compatibility is very, very important. So I have a friend, his name is Vincent, the father of the internet. A lot of times I always, I always worry about my design will make some bad impact to our existing network. And he said, Tina, just remember back compatibility is the most important thing. Yeah, because a lot of things, it's legacy, you have to deal with it, to work with it. And sustainability, this is a word. And we have a lot of sustainability things to do for the power efficient device and the solar powered edge devices. Like we work with Stanford University and we can see the AI edge has been used for the smart grid, smart agriculture, built environment for smart cities, smart buildings, and also even for the EV cars. And some of the regulation issues we have to look at to keep the abreast of evolving data privacy laws. I already consider the edge computing regulation is actually different between China, US, and Europe. And because different uh, power consumption uh, regulation and applies to different regions. And I would like to conclude the, my source Oh, but I do have some backup slides, no worries. Um, the bringing it all together, the Kubernetes and edge computing together, drive the next wave of cloud native innovation. We really think that. Because you've already noticed the presentation is from the edge to the cloud. And also by integrating the best practice. So I really know the edge computing is a very fragmented market. And it's kind of niche market, but there's a lot of opportunities there. And we can ensure a smooth, scalable, and secure edge infrastructure. And here is my email, and Inding's email and LinkedIn. Yeah, you can take picture, feel, feel free to connect with us. I have some reference of my personal website and elfedge.org. And Inding can answer any questions for a project Equino under Elfedge umbrella. FH has like 13 or 14 projects um, uh, currently are very active. Equino is one of them uh, for the, um, I would say, for the last stop of a deployment, integrating all the edge computing uh, technologies. Okay, so I want to invite you. The future is building on ARM for the um, you can uh, visit us to work with us uh, November 27, 29, 
and uh, December 1st in Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai. Come and talk to us. We have the booth number here. And you can also scan the ARM community um, WeChat official uh, account here. And there were like, um, how many? Uh, I'm counting like in English, uh, a lot. <laughs> millions, uh, uh, thousands, millions of, uh, um, yeah, even more uh, developers together at the ARM platform. And I would like to share off some backup slides because this is a technical community. So um, this is the overall architecture, how we have this uh, uh, trial in China, Unicom, I think in Guangzhou province. So we consider some basic uh, requirements for smart cities and we use K3S, thank you, Susan, <laughs> and the edge fires and PASEC, which is a security uh, mechanism, and Triton is an AI uh, open source uh, module. So we integrate them to carry on on the Sonic Gateway device. You can see the Sonic Gateway. These days, like uh, Microsoft is really the leading company in the Sonic as technology, but the Gateway, there are so many uh, white box switches companies. They build Sonic switches. Basically, we run the complete computing power registration of the heterogeneous computing resources. You can see here from the PC, we run the web browser on the Ubuntu. Well, of course, we can also run SUSE. And we have those function ABC, like the system infer or the treatment function one or two, could be video, could be audio. Like at Sonic Gateway, we can run the k server on top of a Sonic. You know, Sonic is more like a operating system for the data center infrastructure networking, right? And then uh, you run the edge fast functions, fast like a function as a service. And also has this uh, PASEC here, client. And going through for the other um, NVIDIA, JSON, Nano number one and number two, uh, uh, the functionality is the same, but we also run the K3S agents on top of them. So it becomes the jet pack. So this uh, field trial is very uh, successful and we got a happy result. The other one I wanna share is the platform, uh, how we do the software together. It's like a, a bigger view, you can look at this. And above the ASIC drivers, network drivers, platform drivers, you can run Sonic as an operating system for the white box switches. And we, for the security point of view, we run the PASX service here, and we use the K3S agent and run this Triton Edgefast and PASX client to communicate with K3S servers. And I would also like to share a use case. Um, the use case number one is the device application machine learning model inference uh, offloading workload. I talk about offloading, right? Because edge computing is really good for offloading for the accelerations of your heavy workloads. Here you can see you can do some emotion uh, recognition. It's not just face recognition. It can tell, oh, you're happy, sad, slightly sad, very angry, that kind of uh, emotion detection or recognition. Here, you will use a camera app, could be your iPhone and your phone, and then it can convert to the pixel array going through the devices on the left-hand side. This uh, edge computing device could do the image process and image resize and convey the images to this pixel array. And then it goes to the edge. The edge will do the inference. It's, we consider it's an engine. And do the recognition of the emotion and the machine learning service of loading APIs. So through the HTTP2 A500 and the protobuf, you go through the gRPC server and session bottle, and then go through the AI service engine manager and the Tensor uh, RT AI framework and then finally, we reach the cloud. The cloud can do the application registration, the emotion recognition model training, and also the model deployment. Finally, the last step is the model source. So this is a complete end-to-end -end case, how you run the AI on the edge. Yeah. Uh, my colleague told me don't take uh, questions. Um, so this is my last slide. Like, is it? 
I don't take questions for Q and A, but if you have something you want me to describe more in details, I'm happy to. Nobody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, please. Uh, maybe give her a microphone. Okay, uh, use German. 嗯，就是刚才几个案例里面有用 KSNS 的，老师之前也提到 c o v e g e 或者 o v e n y e r t 这几个那个边缘的呃云。那在这几个呃，因为我们这个主题是边缘云嘛，那在这这这几个基础设施的选型上面啊、呃，有没有一个呃倾向或者建议？嗯哼 ，Yeah。I think it depends on your deployment scenarios. You can see for the ETC case, we use the uh, Kubernetes, three minutes, thank you. Uh, we use the uh, Kubi Edge, but for the Sonic white boxes, we use the K3S. I think it really depends on how much you communicate between Edge and the cloud, and your use cases, what it cares about. Sometimes it cares about more experience, Sometimes it cares about more accuracy, like for the ETA, ETC, you collect the money, right? You collect the toll fees through the uh, highway, and the accuracy, location, the information is more important. For the Sonic K3S, it's more like uh, how you uh, do this uh, function as a service, because some of the telcos, they want to do function as a service. In this case, they can have their app store and their telco cloud native networks. I think the purpose and the main uh, target is different. Does it, is it enough uh, information for you? Uh, oh, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> 嗯<笑>，大概理解老师意思是说，视野啊、敏感啊这些啊。那还有一种场景是说，我、哦、边缘如果就没有那么多设备，不需要管理几千台啊，或者它是一个相对小规模的，那一定要用云的基础设施嘛，就一定要用 K 八 S 嘛。哦，呃，这就是为什么我用中文讲，这就是为什么我们有时候没有用呃 K 八 S， 我们用的是 Kubernetes 的 Distro， 比如说 K 四 S 啊，或者 Mini K、Mini K 八 S 啊、Q 八 S 啊。这些都是可以用的，所以不一定，就是取决于你的场景有多大，你是不是需要所有的数据都上云收集，对。嗯，甚至说容器是不是必须呢？啊，我们部署的场景有 virtualization， 有像我们部署 cloud 内呃那个呃云游戏的时候，有些方案是基于虚拟化的，有些方案是基于容器的，就是取决于你的客户。或者是你那个云的部门，他们的 TCO，TCO TCO 是最重要的一个一个点，就是、说 TCO， 比如说他用一些板卡的一些交换机啊，能不能完成，呃，这个同样的服务器它能够达到的效果？但是呢，那些板卡的交换机它又不能做到云原生，所以它是有一个我们现在用什么，基于我们现在的条件，保证 TCO， 然后我们将来的未来的发展肯定是要是基于云原生的嘛。所以他会做一个取舍，做一个一步一步的一个 transition migration。Is it time up? Am I time up? 啊，你好，刚才看到你那个架构里面有边端，然后还有云，有三层，然后那个业务里面就是。什么样的业务会放在边进行计算？什么业务放在端？什么样业务放在云？或者说，有没有一个指标，然后能把业务通过这个指标精准的调度到这三个类型当中的某某一个？嗯，对。Okay. 呃，他提示我只有一分钟。呃，那么像比如说这个例子，它是同一个业务，只不过呢，它把这个业务拆分成不同的段，然后这个业务，比如说。他是在边缘做 inference， 但是他的训练是在那个云上面做的，就是说，比如说训练他需要很多算力，他在云上做，但是他很多靠近边缘的像推理啊这种东西是完全可以在呃边缘上做，所以是同一个业务的拆分，而不是说什么业务用在云，什么业务用在边，我理解是这样子。他可能跟你说还有半分钟。<笑>嗯啊，你好。其实就是说，我们在这个业务肯定是要分不同的 task， 或者说是其他更细分的一些维度。
，但是在这个架构或者说是在这个调度的过程当中。我们希望有一个维度，或者是几个维度，通过这个维度来把业务调度到你需要的计算节点或者计算设备上去。那么这个就是一个一个或者是一个通用一个模型的一个调度的维度标准。这这个不知道有没有这种测试？啊，我了解是这个其实是跟每一个呃这个边缘云的提供商他们的倾向性不一样，但大部分是根据 TCO 来算的，就是说。呃，我用这个呃方案，我能跑多少路啊？比如说我打游戏，我跑七百四十路、七百二十路，我用另一个方案能不能跑？能不能达到同样的 TCO？ 它是这样来分，这是最主要。当然呢，呃，有时候他们会跑考虑这个 power consumption， 但是可能不是最主要的。对，我们就是大家可以这个，我的微信是 T I N A T S O U 6， 可以加我，我会继续讨论。好，哎，对。女士说已经到时间了，她要赶我下来了。<笑>好，嗯、uh, ，it's it's very honor to discuss in so much details with everybody. Uh, I wish you have the best、uh, mid autumn festival and national holidays vacations. 呃、uh, ，祝大家双双节快乐，谢谢。